remember we looked at 900 and some of our people voted in that election, 900 and 890-some. Of that amount, um, 884 voted for and 157 voted against. So the, the vote for the Constitution was overwhelming back then. And remember, we did that under something called the Indian Reorganization Act. Those of you who have elders that you've spoken to, they used to refer to that act as the Wheeler-Howard Act, the Wheeler-Howard Act. Those were the two senators who introduced it in the United States Constitution. And as we talked last week, there were some promises made to Indians to get them to do that. But as I told the group, in my own research, I found that it really there was competing promises. Mr. Wheeler, in introducing the act, his goal was really to bring about an end to Indian governments, to do what I called make us like them, that policy called assimilation. Let's make those Indians like us, and then they'll be good people, and we can eventually absorb them into the mainstream of our government and our society. The Indian people, they didn't understand that. The promise to them was right here. Here was the promises made to Indian people. First, self-rule. The tribal council is going to be in control of all affairs of the tribe, among other things. So, gee, we're giving you folks the right to do anything you want to yourselves, to control your territory. Second, there was the old revolving credit fund. And those of you old enough to remember know that back when we had tribal credit, when the Bureau first had it, and up until 1996, we had the revolving credit fund. That was a fund that the government put up. We borrowed money from that fund, and then we paid that money back, and we could borrow more. We used that money primarily for ranching and farming, but you could borrow loans for other purposes. So the promise there, and again, the goal there of the white people was, oh, we'll make them Indians into good farmers and ranchers and business people, and again, they'll, they'll be like us then. They'll, they'll look like us. So the last carrot there was no more loss of land. Now, it said many, allot many allotments were lost to outside interests starting in 1907. So we actually had two allotment acts, the Blackfeet. We had the 1906 allotment act, and the main feature of that one was if you got land under that, that's, you got the minerals too. That's why some of us still get mineral leases and mineral money from those leases. But the second allotment act that we had was in 1919. And if you got allotted under that act, you didn't get the minerals. The tribe, the minerals were reserved to the tribe. That's why, for those of you who don't know, some of us get those mineral leases and we get income from that. And other people who got allotments, maybe were handed down just in their family, they don't get anything because their allotment came under the 1919 Allotment Act. Now, allotment was when the government said, that's how we ended up with this map back here that looks the way it does. The government said, we're going to take the reservation and you, Daryl, you can come in and all your family and you can pick out Three, 400 acres, you can pick out 360 here and 40 someplace else. And that got divided up, people allotted in 10 acre tracks and 40 acre tracks. Some families got allotments together, other families they were spread plumb out. Jalant part of inherited part of an allotment way up in the northeast corner of the reservation that still had the minerals with it. But today there's about 190 of us on that allotment, that one little 40-acre tract up there through inheritance. But then the other part of allotment was the right now. Allotment was we got that land, but it wasn't ours outright. It still said in trust for Joe McKay or in trust for Daryl or in trust for Mary or whoever in the name of the federal government. But we got the use rights. 
What they allowed us to do from 1906 until 1934 or 35 was to get fee patents on it or to mortgage our allotments. And so that's how people lost their allotments, lost their land. That's why we have all that yellow land on that map back there is that we were allowed to mortgage them, sell them outright, and a lot of people did that, think needing the money and not realizing what was going to happen. Other people mortgaged it to the business people not understanding what was going to happen. And when they didn't pay their grocery bill, the grocery man went to the government and said, oh, Joe owes me $500 on his grocery bill, and he signed his land over to me for it, I want to foreclose on that land. I want it given to me in fee status. So those were called forced fee patents. And so that's how during that time that we lost that land. Now there's a reference up there to something called the Dawes Act. It's really the act of 1887, not 97. And the reason that's important to us today is that that act was the f first thing legal basis for all allotments all across America. And one of the key provisions of that act said that when you got a patent and fee on your allotment, it becomes subject to state taxes. And so today, that's why people that own fee land, even us Indians that own fee land, it's subject to state taxes. And that's why you can periodically look in the Glacier Reporter or the Cut Bank Pioneer Press, and you see in that legal section, tax deed sale. And they list all of these lands on the reservation. Those are Indian fee lands, land that we as Indians, somebody owns outright in fee, but they didn't pay the taxes on. They might not understand they owe the taxes, or they might not have the money to pay it. And so they, the state, the county sells that land there are white people from all over. There's one guy I remember from California who just watches papers like that. And when he sees those tax deed sales, he puts a bid on them. And, and he buys that land. And it becomes his land outright. And so Indians continue to lose their land in that way. So that's why that act is important. Because it's the basis to allow the state to tax our Indian fee land. Now as long as our land is still held in trust, the state doesn't have any right to tax it or do anything to it. So that's kind of what brings us up to where we are today. So our present constitution still provides for oversight by the Secretary of Interior. It says the approval of the Secretary is required in many actions of the Tribal Council. The Secretary of Appear Interior appears 26 times in our current Constitution. So once again, that notion that the Great White Father has to watch over his children is still there, even though this is 2014, almost, almost 100 years after we adopted that. Gee, we have computers, we can flash them up on the screen, we have satellites and all kinds of things. But we as Indians are still viewed as needing the, the supervision of the Great White Father to look over us, make sure we don't do nothing wrong. Since the early Blackfeet Tribal Business Council was unable to obtain funds for economic opportunities without BIA consent, that's still true today. If the tribe wants to borrow money, of course a bank, any bank, anybody that's borrowed money, even a car, when you buy that money, borrow that money for that car, the bank says two things. How are you going to repay me? What's your income? And I want a collateral. I want something to secure my loan. So they take a security interest in your car. Well, when the tribe goes to borrow money, they say, well, how are you going to secure that? We want an interest in your trust income. We want you to pledge your trust income. And so, in order to do that, the BIA has to consent to that action. Or let's say, like when they buy the Smith Ranch, it's in trust already. The lender, they say, well, we want a security interest in that land. 
Because it's trust land, the BIA has to approve that. So we still have to do that today. Well into the 1940s, allotments were continued to be lost by forced fee patent. And most importantly, the present Constitution does not provide for a separation of powers. All the power is centralized in a council, leaving the people with no recourse other than election. So in other words, if the council does whatever they want, the only, only time we can change that is when we have a council election. Then we can elect different people. But something happens when people get on the council. And I don't mean to criticize them, but in my own opinion, that's why we don't see seven or eight other council members here tonight. Some, let's be honest, not on this particular night. We've had tragedies and some people are ill. But generally speaking, once you get there, you get on that council, you sit at that table, and you realize how much power you got don't want to give it up. What? Have a, have a referendum? Change the Constitution? End my term? I don't want to do that. Gee, wait till my term's up. Then, then you can do that. And so that's why it's been so hard for us to make those kinds of changes. The council is reluctant to give up its own power once they realize the power that they have. And because we have no separation of powers, in other words, no checks and balances, no, no one can, you can't go to court today and say, the council is abusing this part of its power. I want an order against them saying that they can't do that. A few years back in a case involving Pat Shelt, when Pat Shelt was removed from the council, he went to court and our court of appeals said, oh gee, if it's within the council's power under the Constitution, we got no jurisdiction over it. We can't review that. And in other words, the council can do anything it wants as long as they can point to something under the Constitution. Court's not going to review that. They're, they say they have no jurisdiction. So there's no checks and balances. There's no way to hold the council itself accountable for what it does or doesn't do. So that's a quick review of where we were up until this point last time. And then we talked already about our territory and what it's limited to. And it says it's defined by the agreement of 1895. As I said, that's the Seated Strip. The Seated Strip is the whole thing from Glacier Park down to Lewis and Clark National Forest, the Badger Two Medicine. That whole strip is the Seated Strip. The next thing was membership. And as we saw from the original document, we amended that to include the quarter degree of Indian blood. Now, the other thing we did talk about is that section two. It says the council shall have the power to promulgate ordinances subject to review by the Secretary of Interior governing future membership and the adoption of new members. And as I pointed out last time, you can read that to mean that if the council met tomorrow and it wanted to, it could pass a resolution saying we're changing the membership. We don't have to have a referendum vote. We're going to do it right now. And so that's, you just need to be aware that that's among the reasons that we need to change this document to put in some checks and balances to make sure that the council can't exercise power without the people's some some form of control whether it be by our legislature or not now the governing body we looked at the old constitution the main changes that we see there are the council is now nine members and as i pointed out notice that we changed the agency district to the browning district but we still have the other one now here's the other big change the election of all council members shall be submitted to the entire electorate of the reservation. That's what took away that community representation. That's why we have at-large voting. It goes on to say it, it sets up the residency requirement, right? That now you have to be a resident of the reservation for a year 
and you have to reside in your district for at least six months prior to the time that you become a candidate. So those are the changes, the amendments that we made to the first two sections. Now the other thing that was in the last one that's still here is it says that in lieu of districts, the council shall have the power to establish communities and the basis of representation on the tribal council from such communities subject to popular vote. So again, the council could pass a resolution tomorrow. So we want to go back to representative districts. Only people from Hart Butte vote for them. Only people from Old Agency, only people from Seville vote for each other. And if they did, the, that, the people would still have to vote on that change. Go ahead. I'm talking about for the, see when you guys get elected to get in the council, you have no right saying we have the power to do this and we have the power to do that. You must remember who got you in there. And each and every one of you are in there for the people, not for yourself and not for this group or this group. Because they want open enrollment or they want something done about what they want. Well, this is for the people. Yeah. What? Oh, so...